Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm here to talk about Lady at the OK Corral. Um, and it's wonderful to talk to uh, the Google audience, since who could write a book today without Google? Um, and I was here with my first book, Salah's, Salah's Gift. Um, I, I was first intrigued by the story of Josephine Marcus Earp um, when I learned that she'd been a Jewish woman in Tombstone. A Jewish woman in Tombstone sort of sounds like a joke you might read on The Onion. Um, and I thought about how much I thought I knew about uh, the Old West, which turned out to be mostly untrue. Um, and so this became for me a journey into the untold story of uh, the Old West. Um, like a lot of uh, people who grew up in the 50s, um, it was all about watching Wyatt Earp on, on television. That's actually a picture of me as a baby. Um, and um, the things that I thought I didn't know began to overwhelm the things that I did know. Um, for instance, where were the women of the West? When you read the early stories about, uh, about Tombstone and, uh, and the frontier, it was as if there were no wives, mothers, women, daughters of, of any kind. Um, because all you read about was the, the men. And yet, um, I was finding out that there was a woman in Tombstone, um, a Jewish woman in Tombstone named Josephine Marcus. Um, so that was enormously intriguing to me. Then there was the idea of the gunfight at the OK Corral. Um, so I have a, uh, a Google alert on OK Corral. And every single day, um, there is something in the news that evokes the idea of the OK Corral. Um, it may be something totally unrelated, something like um, a congressional showdown, or um, an NBA game, or um, a teachers union fight. I remember seeing that one. But every single day, there is something. It is sunk so deeply into the American psyche as the idea of confrontation. And yet, here was this woman this gutsy, busty broad who had a lover on both sides of the OK Corral. So instead of the story of politics and power that I thought the OK Corral was all about, um, it was also a tale of, of jealousy and revenge. And then there's the story of Wyatt Earp himself. We think of him as the lawman wearing the white hat. Well, it turns out that the story that we know was really shaped by Josephine Marcus Earp, his, his wife. Um, this, was a, um, this was a way for a, uh, a good, clean story to be told about Wyatt. And Josephine was really a, a master of celebrity and, and image shaping. But let me sort of take you back to the beginning of, uh, of Josephine's life. Um, what she told everybody was that she was the daughter of a wealthy German merchant. None of that was true. Her family was not wealthy, and they were not German. Um, they were actually from Prussia, or what is now Poland. Um, and that's a very important distinction, as it, as it turns out. So her family came to the United States around 1850. Um, Josephine was born in 1860. They lived uh, in New York. She lived in New York during the Civil War. And then um, her family was not doing pretty well economically. Her dad was struggling to make it as a baker. And everywhere in the New York press, you would read about San Francisco and all the wonderful things that were happening in San Francisco. And that was even before Silicon Valley. So um, Josephine's family picked up again and left, uh, left New York and went out to San Francisco. Um, and the community that they arrived in, and they would have arrived by steamer through the Isthmus of, of, uh, of Panama, which had opened fairly recently. Um, the community that they arrived in was a thriving Jewish community, um, but it was a highly stratified community. There were the German Jews, who tended to be the more affluent, educated, um, uh, politically involved Jews, and then there was everybody else. And the Polish Jews were at the bottom of the everybody else. Um, and so Josephine grew up in a San Francisco where her family was sort of on the wrong side of the tracks. And Josephine was not a young woman who wanted to be on the wrong side of anything. Um, so she ran away from home. She was uh, about 18 years old. And the pinafore craze was sweeping America um, to an extent that you cannot even imagine now. Um, but every town seemed to have a pinafore company. Um, Josephine wasn't much of a singer, but she was kind of a good dancer and 
um, and felt that she could uh, act her way through a part on, on the pinafore. And so she joined a touring company that was going to the Arizona Territory. Um, she joined the Pauline Markham Touring Company, and uh, there's Ms. Markham uh, lying out on the, on the couch there. Um, and uh, she danced the sailor's hornpipe and uh, was, you know, pretty competent at it. Um, but the important thing was that while she was uh, on tour with the company, she caught the eye of the man who would soon become the first sheriff of Cochise County. No, not Wyatt Earp, Johnny Bean. Um, so she comes to, ooh, you know what? Uh, let me cover her up. Um, and before I even get you to Tombstone, um, let me tell you a little bit about what Josephine looked like. She was small, she was very curvy, um, and uh, we don't really know anything about um, uh, authenticated pictures of her as a young woman um, because she either destroyed them or they were lost, possibly in the 1906 um, San Francisco earthquake. Um, and most of the pictures that you find uh, online today are not her. Um, but I've done an extensive amount of analysis, um, really with a forensic artist um, uh, who's a professor at, um, at John Jay College at the City University of New York, to take the authenticated photographs that we have of Josephine, which are mostly of her in, in later life, and to do a regression analysis to sort of figure out which of the photos that have been put forth about Josephine really might be her. So if you look at these photographs here, the ones along the top are ones that uh, I have some reason to believe are Josephine and have been examined by the forensic uh, analyst. And the ones at the bottom really are Josephine. Um, and I've done a, um, uh, an interview with the artist, which you can see up at ladyattheokcorral.com. Um, I would give anything for a, a picture that I was absolutely certain with uh, was, was Josephine, but in the meantime, we settled for these. Okay, back to Tombstone. So um, in 1879, um, Wyatt Earp and his brothers arrive in Tombstone. They all have wives, common law wives, um, and Wyatt is with uh, Maddie Blaylock, the woman here over on the, on the left, um, and um, that's Wyatt in the middle, um, an incredibly handsome man of uncommon charisma, um, really quite striking, um, and as you'll see, he retains those characteristics even uh, as an older man. The fellow on the right is Johnny Bean, the first sheriff of Cochise County. Um, the, so the people on either side of Wyatt, those are the people that Josephine most didn't want you to know about. Um, because for the rest of her life, what she would be trying to hide would be, first of all, that she came to Tombstone to be the common law wife of Johnny Bean, and second of all, that Wyatt already had a wife in Tombstone, and that was Maddie Blaylock. Um, I said she came to Tombstone to be the common law wife. That's not really true. She came to Tombstone to marry Johnny Bean. But when she got there, the situation was very different. Um, it turns out that um, Johnny had been married. He was now divorced, um, but uh, he had a nine-year-old son, and he expected Josephine to take care of his nine-year-old son. That was fine. Josephine and Albert became very good friends and remained close for the rest of her life. Um, but she didn't count on Johnny's total lack of interest in actually getting married, um, nor did she count on the fact that Johnny was uh, a womanizer. So once she gets there, um, she discovers that Johnny is not the man she expected to be. She leaves him, and that's when she meets Wyatt Earp, um, who's now the deputy U.S. Marshal of Tombstone. The gunfight at the OK Corral, um, if you want to be a real insider, um, you should probably raise your hand immediately and say, but, 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 it didn't really take place at the OK Corral, did it? And the truth is, no, it didn't. It took place on Fremont Street um, outside of the OK Corral. Um, but, you know, certainly in common parlance, we think of it as the, as the OK Corral. Um, Josephine was in Tombstone. She heard the shots. She runs to uh, the site of where the OK Corral was, sees that Wyatt, of all the people involved in the shootout, is unscathed, um, and, she, and she leaves. Um, the events afterwards um, involve Wyatt's uh, brother being murdered um, and uh, his other brother being severely injured. Um, 
it's clear at this point that um, that there's no time anymore for uh, romance or love in, in Tombstone. Um, Wyatt sends his common-law wife, Maddie Blaylock, off to his parents. I actually think this was the most cowardly act that Wyatt Earp ever, um, ever did. He sends Maddie Blaylock off to his parents um, with the expectation that he will come for her. Um, she could have waited for the rest of her life because he never was going to come for her. Um, Josephine realizes that uh, it's time for her to get out of Tombstone as well, and she goes back to uh, her long-suffering immigrant parents in, uh, in San Francisco. And she, too, is waiting for Wyatt, only Wyatt really does come for, it, for Josephine. So this couple that met in this tumultuous time in Tombstone, which was then the largest city in Arizona, um, a bustling silver mining town, um, they end up spending the next 47 years together. Um, and it is a tale of remarkable love of adventure. Um, they were fortune seeking, but they never really cared that much about money. It was great when they had it, and they made do when they, when they didn't. But the nonstop love of adventure is what always gets me. Um, these were two people who never really grew up. Um, the, the greatest adventure that they had, or at least the one that, um, that I think I'm fondest of, uh, is when they went to Alaska for the, for the gold rush. So, you know, we, we think about uh, the Alaska gold rush, we think about what it takes to, uh, to mine for gold. Um, all of that was very labor intensive, you needed a lot of equipment, until 1899. And in 1899, um, gold was discovered in Nome, Alaska. And it was not only uh, that there was gold in Nome, Alaska, but it was on the public beach, on the shore of the Bering Sea. You could go right out there with a little, um, a little pan, as you see me there um, on the Bering Sea, and, and you know, just sort of shuffle it around and gold would appear, imagine. Um, so you can see the crowds that are massing in the picture on the upper left um, on the waterfront in Seattle by the summer of 1900 when the news swept America that you could pan for gold um, right on the surface of the, of the sea, um, there were just tens of thousands of people who were trying to get to Nome, which the summer before had a population of about 50. So um, there, was, there were no hotels, there was nothing, there was just these white, uh, these white tents that you see in this sort of fuzzy picture on the, on the bottom left. Um, Wyatt and Josephine made a fortune there. Um, it, was a, it was a very difficult time for Josephine um, because she was so far away from her family. She was still very close to her relatives. Um, but she stuck it out in Nome. Um, she stuck it out in all the places that they, they went to. Um, and when they left Nome, they really had enough money to live comfortably for the rest of their life if they were careful. This was not a careful couple. So um, money tended to slip through their fingers, you know, probably the way that those gold flecks um, went through your fingers in, uh, in the Bering Sea. Um, they spent most of the rest of their life going in a circuit between Los Angeles and San Francisco, Oakland, where her family lived, and to the desert between, uh, right between Arizona and, and California. Um, and this is a picture of them in their desert camp. You can see Wyatt there is feeding their little dog, Erpy. Um, and Josephine, who's gotten a little portly, um, is, is, looking, uh, is looking over them. Josephine was a woman who loved luxury. She loved fancy hotels. She loved clean sheets and, and good food. Um, but she also loved the outdoors. She also loved living out in the, in the desert. Um, and so there were the, these two sides to her character. Um, similarly, when we think about um, my title, Lady at the OK Corral, um, Josephine's uh, feeling about being a lady also was filled with conflict. Um, on the one hand, she wanted to be respectable, um, as her sister was. Her sister had become a successful uh, businesswoman and, um, and pillar of society in Oakland, San Francisco. Um, and Josephine admired her sister a lot, um, but there was a part of Josephine that was remarkably rebellious and always searching for adventure. So when you think of her uh, living out in the, in the desert with, um, with Wyatt and, and their dog, it's that adventuresome side that was, that was uppermost. As the years go by, 
um, Tombstone is actually never far from public consciousness. And in 1929, the first Hell Dorado days um, were held in uh, in Tombstone, which at this point, uh, all the all the mines were gone, was really pretty much just a, a tourist town. Um, but the most important thing that happened um, from Wyatt and Josephine's point of view was that Hollywood had come to uh, come to Los Angeles, and a lot of the early movies were actually westerns. Um, and the two, uh, the two heroes you see here, William S. Hart and Tom Mix, were amongst the most popular early cowboys. Um, and they were both very, very close friends of, of Wyatt's. Um, and um, as stories began to appear, Josephine's ability to, um, to manage Wyatt's public relations began to be her, her driving compulsion. Um, Wyatt was famous in his own lifetime, um, but there was always controversy about the OK Corral. Who had shot first? Was Wyatt a hero um, or, uh, as I've heard him described, a um, homicidal maniac? Um, so the, these, this controversy, controversy was always raging. Uh, Josephine's, uh, Josephine attempted to squash bad stories if she knew they were going to occur. Um, if they uh, if they already had come out, then she would mount a public relations campaign. Again, very modern. She would reach out to Wyatt's famous friends, the Cowboys, or uh, people like um, Tasker Adi, the senator and uh, and governor of Nevada, who was a, a big fan of of Wyatt's, um, and get them to write stories on Wyatt's behalf. And then, if all else failed. She would try and get a retraction. Um, Wyatt had been friends uh, in his youth with um, with the father of William Randolph Hearst, and so Josephine would do things like call up William Randolph Hearst and say, "Mr. Hearst, there's this terrible article in the Los Angeles paper. You must kill it. Um, and if it couldn't be killed, get me a retraction." And and she would. She would occasionally get a, a retraction. Um, but that wasn't good enough. Um, what they really needed was to tell their own story. And so when a, uh, an enterprising writer and uh, press agent uh, named Stuart Lake approached Josephine uh, and Wyatt with the idea of writing a biography, Josephine thought, well, this is the way to actually get our, our story out. We will shape the story. Um, and uh, he sat with Wyatt uh, many, many times throughout uh, 1928 and 29. Um, and as it turned out, these were the last months of, of Wyatt's life. Um, until the day he died, he remained that incredibly handsome, tall, strapping, six foot two uh, fellow that, uh, that first came into Tombstone. Josephine, alas, this is really not fair, um, but she didn't age as well as, as Wyatt did, and that's a picture of her in, in later life. Wyatt died in January 1929. Um, the scene from the pallbearers at his funeral included Tom Mix and, and William S. Hart, as well as playwrights like uh, William, William Meisner. Um, and really began to um, take shape in a national news story about the death of the West, the death of the old frontier, with Wyatt Earp as its most famous um, symbol. Um, Josephine wrote to, um, to uh, Stuart Lake and asked him to come to the funeral, which he did. Um, and then in the year following Wyatt's death, um, finally that that book was published, and although it's now the height of the Depression, it was an immediate bestseller, um, and to my knowledge, has actually never gone out of print. So um, Josephine's left alone, um, no real means of support, except that she does share in the royalties from, from the book. And uh, in 1932, 1933, Lincoln Ellsworth, the famous Arctic explorer, approaches Josephine to say, that he's going back to the to the South Pole, and he'd like to go um, and somehow honor his hero Wyatt Earp, and he comes up with the idea of naming his ship after Wyatt Earp. Well, how does Josephine feel about that? Well, we already know Josephine is a PR master, so she thinks this is a great idea, and she supplies Lincoln Ellsworth with Wyatt's last pair of eyeglasses, and. Um, and she gives him one of Wyatt's shotguns, and, and Lincoln Ellsworth creates a little shrine in his, uh, in his cabin. And off goes, off goes the ship. Um, and there's a photograph from the LA Times um, of, of Josephine and, and Lincoln Ellsworth. 
But what's really interesting here is that it's, it's hard for us to imagine today how the public was obsessed with Lincoln Ellsworth and this trip to, uh, to the Arctic. Um, Wyatt was in the New York Times, the name Wyatt Earp, again, following the Lincoln Ellsworth ship, um, at least once a month for six years because people were, were following every step of Lincoln Ellsworth's voyage. Um, and when Lincoln Ellsworth was lost at sea, then it was a front page story um, for you know, weeks on end. Um, if you look at the New York Times uh, from January 22nd, um, 1936, here's the day when Edward VII is proclaimed you know, the, new, the new leader of, of England. And there over on the left-hand side of the page, um, on, on, the, on the front page of the New York Times is, you know, good old Wyatt Earp because Lincoln Ellsworth has been found. He'd been lost at sea. Now he was found. And again, Wyatt Earp is back on the front page. So, so in the, in the mid-30s, after the Stuart Lake biography, you get this turbo charge of, of good PR um, for, for Wyatt Earp. Josephine, um, I think, was sort of emboldened by this to think that maybe now it was the time to tell her story. And of course, she, she's eager for the money um, on top of, of everything else. She sees an article in the Times about, uh, in the LA Times, about an ERP relative who happens to be uh, a writer. And she finds uh, a family in LA, the uh, Kaysen and the Ackerman family, who are ERP relatives. And she begins to work with these two wonderful women about writing her biography. And there she is over on the left. You can see she's slimmed down a little bit. She kind of looks like an Italian widow. Um, and there she's with the, the Kaysen family. Um, they work intensively together. Um, they even go back to Tombstone. Um, they stop off at what has now been renamed um, in honor of Wyatt Earp, the town of Earp, California. There's Josephine with one of her biographers. Um, she visits Tombstone for the first time since 1882. That must have been um, a, an incredible, incredible journey. Um, and they write this memoir together. Um, only, I'll take you back here, only um, the closer they get to the truth, the closer they get to finding out about Josephine's relationship to Johnny Bean and the story of Maddie Blaylock, Josephine begins, begins to get really nervous about this. Um, I told you that Maddie Blaylock had gone back to Wyatt's parents when Wyatt never did show up for her. Um, Maddie finally, uh, finally read the tea leaves and left, uh, left his parents' house. Um, she had no visible means of support, very little education. Um, she became a prostitute, a drug addict, um, and eventually committed suicide, telling anybody who would listen that this had all happened because she had been deserted by, by Wyatt Earp. That's the story that Josephine didn't want anyone to know. And so the more, uh, the more digging the, uh, the, the Kaysen family was doing into Josephine's past, the more nervous she became, until she became so nervous um, that she said, uh, that's the end of the, of the biography. We're not going to do this memoir. Um, she forced them to burn the manuscript, and she put a curse on anyone who would tell her story, which I confess sometimes makes me nervous. Um, but I figure there must be a statute of limitations um, on that. Um, after that happened, um, Josephine's life sort of spiraled uh, down herself. She had, uh, she had very little money. Um, and uh, she was increasingly paranoid and would go to visit some of Wyatt's friends, um, one in particular named John Flood, sort of stalking him. And um, he got nervous and began to record the things that she would do, like the day that uh, she showed up at his door, put her fist through the screen, and said, I'll get back at you good and hard. Um, and this is a page from uh, a, a manuscript page that John Flood wrote, um, I guess sort of keeping track of, uh, of Josephine's activities. Um, but she didn't have too much longer to live. She died in, in 1944. Um, when Wyatt died, uh, Josephine, whose feeling about being Jewish was pretty much, well, it's a fact about me, but not necessarily, as Nora Ephron said, not necessarily the most important fact about me. She really had very little relationship to any of the Jewish communities that were at the time in Tombstone or Nome or, or any of those. Um, and yet when it came time to figure out where to bury Wyatt Earp, 
she did turn back to her religion and she buried him in the Jewish cemetery outside of San Francisco where her parents were buried. When she died in 1944, um, destitute, and her funeral expenses were paid by Sidney Grauman, as of Grauman's Theater, and, uh, and William S. Hart. They had been friends of, of Josephine's and, and Wyatt's. Um, her funeral was officiated over by a rabbi, and then she was buried in the same cemetery. Um, so um, the story of, of Josephine and Wyatt, um, which stretches over these 47, uh, 47 years, um, took me to a lot of different places. Um, I didn't actually go everywhere on this um, on this uh, map, I think I missed uh, El Paso. Um, but um, there was a tremendous amount of research that went into it. Um, and I thought you might want to take a look at some of the original letters um, that I used to put the story together. You know, anytime you assemble a story like this, it's kind of like a giant jigsaw puzzle. Um, and Josephine's original letters uh, were very much part of it. By the way, one of the things I discovered um, in working with some young college students at Macaulay Honors College is that um, they didn't know how to read cursive handwriting. Um, you know, they kept wanting me to put it through optical character recognition and it would all come out great. Um, I said, no, no, it doesn't, it doesn't quite work that way yet. Um, so we had, we had a very interesting time teaching 20-somethings uh, how, um, how to read Josephine's handwriting, which I can read very well, but that's because I'm a little older. Um, there was also a tremendous amount of work to be done. Um, the uh, the Cason family, I told you they were uh, they were uh, ordered to uh, burn that manuscript by Josephine. They didn't do it. Um, there was a copy that they kept of the manuscript, um, and that manuscript sits today in uh, in Dodge City, um, where I spent many happy days uh, working on it. Um, again, these are interesting skills that um, are not necessarily. Um, going to be around in the 22nd century, but in the 21st century, the ability to look at a handwritten, hand-edited manuscript um, is still very important. Um, and I did work in, in many fine libraries uh, and, and archives. Um, it was really a, a wonderful research um, project for me. Um, so um, that's the story of Josephine Marcus Earp, the untold story of Josephine Marcus Earp. Um, to my mind, you can't tell the story of American history without the story of the Old West and the, and the frontier. And you can't tell that story without putting the women back in the picture. Um, and when it comes to putting women back in the picture, I don't think you get much more interesting than, than Josephine Marcus Earp. Thank you very much. Any questions for me? You know, if you want to ask me about the first time I heard the word Google, I can tell you that. Oh, yes. Um, the the question was, um, why did I uh, feel that I had to authenticate the photos of, of Josephine Earp? Um, the world of what I call Planet Earp. Um, is an extremely contentious one. Um, I did my last book on uh, Holocaust um, history, and I thought that was a very complicated world, and it certainly is. Um, but the, uh, the contentiousness, um, the quarrels, the feuds amongst ERP historians, and there are many amateur ERP historians, um, are, are unlike anything I have ever seen. Um, they are still fighting the gunfight at the OK Corral. As a result, there's a great deal of skepticism. Well, you didn't really find that. That's really not true. Um, and so I knew that whatever I did would be questioned and questioned and questioned again. So I felt that I had to take um, the pictures that, if you, if you go on Wikipedia until I change it, um, the picture that's up there now is absolutely not Josephine Marcus Earp. It makes no sense from any analysis. Um, and yet people have put it forth. Um, you know, it's like the tale of the Loch Ness Monster. If somebody's making money on something, they have all the, all the reasons to, um, to, to keep that legend up. Um, and so that's why I went to such great lengths to authenticate the photographs. Um, how many other women did you find while you were researching uh, 
Josephine Marcus Earp. You said that there were a lot. Can you name or offer any other stories about who you found? There, there were a lot. Um, I, I would sort of, in the category of women of the West um, and women in, in Tombstone, um, there were some very interesting characters like Nellie Cashman, who was a very successful entrepreneur. Uh, in Tombstone. I thought she was absolutely fascinating. Um, and I was also interested in the story of women like Addie Borland, who was the milliner in town, um, who was the only woman to testify at the inquest after, uh, after the gunfight at, at the OK Corral. Um, but when you, when you look at the, uh, the possible roles for women in Tombstone, um, there really weren't a whole lot of choices. Um, you know, there was one, one woman who ran a school, and there was one woman who was there. Um, actually, I should, let me pause on her. Probably the most, to me, uh, one of the most interesting uh, women in, uh, in, in Tombstone. Um, she was a, uh, a journalist, um, and for some reason right now, because you've asked me, I'm blanking on her name, but I'm, I'm going to come up with it in a second. Um, she was from San Diego, and uh, she wrote dispatches back to the San Diego paper over the course of a year and a half, which included the gunfight at the, at the OK Corral. Um, and so many of, the, uh, many of the firsthand impressions we have come from her pen. Um, and she had a, a career afterwards as a, as a successful journalist. She was um, one, of the, uh, one of the examples of professional women. Um, but there were many other women who were there as, uh, as wives and uh, family, family people. Um, John Clum, the mayor, uh, was married to a very interesting woman. Um, and there were an awful lot of prostitutes in, uh, in Tombstone as well. Um, the community that followed the boom towns included gamblers, saloon keepers, and prostitutes. And as the next boom town emerged, they would they would come to the they would come to the fore, um, so lots of interesting women. Um, the other category of women that I've I've now gotten interested in is um, the category of the woman behind the man, the woman who shapes the man's story. Um, you know, I've I've told you that I think this was a, a burning passion for uh, for Josephine. You think about Nancy Reagan. How could you ever have a biography of of Ronald Reagan that didn't talk about Nancy, um, or Libby Custer? Um, who spent you know, most of, of her life um, scrubbing up the image of, of Custer um, and, and making sure that what he would be remembered for is what she thought he would be remembered for. By the way, Josephine's efforts um, to keep the story of Johnny Bean and, uh, and Maddie Blaylock um, away from us um, was really entirely successful in her own lifetime. Um, in 1955, the story of Maddie Blaylock did emerge. Um, but it hasn't, it hasn't been widely told. It certainly hasn't overshadowed the, the legend of Wyatt Earp. You mentioned that the, <clears throat> that the Jewish community, that there were Jewish communities in Tombstone and Nome. How large were those communities? They were, they were pretty large. Um, there was a, uh, a Hebrew benevolent association um, that had, I would say, somewhere between 50 and 100 people um, who were part of it in, in Tombstone. There were Jews who served on the jury um, for the, the inquest following the, the gunfight. Um, in, uh, in Nome, Alaska, uh, the story of the first High Holy Day services in September 1900 was a, first, was a front page story in the Nome newspapers. Um, you know, today they call them the frozen chosen. Um, and there's, uh, there's a large, there are large Jewish communities throughout, uh, well, large is probably an exaggeration. There are, there are sizable Jewish communities uh, throughout Alaska. Um, Alaska, uh, part of the story of the economic um, settling of Alaska was the Alaska Commercial Company, which was started in San Francisco, um, actually originally started uh, by Russian, uh, by the Russian government, but was then bought by a group of Jewish businessmen in, um, in San Francisco and was really the company store in places like Nome uh, or Rampart, Alaska, which was another place that the, that the herbs were. Um, and I often think, you know, particularly in Tombstone, when Josephine left Johnny Bean 
um, and was not publicly uh, together with Wyatt. Those must have been very dark days for her. Um, and yet, I never found any evidence that she turned for support or comfort to the, to the Jewish community. And that distinction I made between the German and the Polish Jews, which was so important in San Francisco, was really meaningless in the frontier. Um, no one really seemed to care about that at all. Clara Brown. Clara Spaulding Brown. Memory is a funny thing, um, but somewhere in that last question, um, her, name, her name came to, uh, came to my, my mind. Thank you very much.